gracias. Thank you guys for coming. As sweet. Oh, sorry. You're okay. Yeah, as sweet. As I've been talking about having this new space as a space for education, for community. And so this is the first one. We'll see how it goes and we hope to have more people in the future. Thank you for supporting and uh, thanks to Jody who agreed to be like the guinea pig. To <laughs> 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 be the, the first one. So uh, yeah, and with the support of the board and all the, the members, so we hope to uh, get the, the ball rolling and see if this grows in the future. So without further ado, Great. Thank you, Jody. Thank you, Carl. Yeah, okay. Thank yeah. you for the opportunity, and thank you, all of you, for helping with this space and keeping it here. Um, so I'm Jody Powell. I am a naturopathic doctor here in Carbondale. Um, so as a naturopathic doctor, what that means is that I've been to eight years of school, uh, four years of med school, but a special med school, a naturopathic medical school. So I learn um, all the things that the MDs have to learn, the drugs and the surgery and all the primary care, basic stuff. And then I also learn um, a lot more nutrition, um, chiropractic, homeopathy, herbs, um, black flower remedies, massage, energetic medicine, IV therapy. There's a whole lot of different modalities that naturopathic doctors will do. Um, and we're all, uh, we all have different interests. So we, we have a very broad, um, you know, no two naturopathic doctors are really going to be quite the same. Um, and no, you know, if, if 10 different people with the same diagnosis, you know, go to naturopathic doctors, they'll get 12 different, you know, treatment plans. Because we do different things and different things for different people. So um, I'm excited to be part of the community. I have been in the Valley three years and I moved my office to Carbondale this past winter. Um, so I've just been over on Village Road um, for, uh, for since January. Um, not too long, but it feels great. I'm also at the Farmer's Market every Wednesday um, here in Carbondale. So um, to answer questions, talk to people, just kind of be available. There's a lot of education to do about what my profession is and what it has to offer because um, people don't really understand it and they think, oh yeah, I know somebody who does what you do or I know somebody who is what you are. And I'm like, mm, it's not Hillary, you probably don't because we're very, you know, um, we're very different. There's a lot of great alternative medicine in the Valley, but we, we all do um, different things and have different kinds of training. So anyway, um, enough about that. I want to talk about labeling, and I want to talk about organic and natural and GMO. And you guys are a pretty educated bunch. So um, does everybody know who Jeffrey Smith is? Okay. Seen Genetic Roulette, seen Food Inc. Okay. Food Inc. Okay. So um, there's, I could talk for hours about labeling and about GMOs, um, but I don't want to talk for hours. I don't have that much time. So I want to hit on a couple of um, high points of things that I was pretty sure nobody would know a whole lot about, and then we can delve into some things a little bit deeper. Um, first of all, um, I wanted to start with organic and natural and what those definitions are, because that was, that was kind of the starting point. So do you guys know, um, are, you, are any of you familiar with you know the, the the legal ramifications of having an organic label on something? Okay, so so some of you aren't familiar. So I'll give you just kind of the basics. Um, so organic is a more proprietary term. If you're going to put organic on a food package, you better hold to some standards. Um, and there's a couple of different um, ways to categorize organic. Um, so the the definition is. Organic produce and other ingredients are grown without the use of pesticides, synthetic fertilizers, sewage sludge, genetically modified organisms, or ionized radiation. Animals that produce meat, poultry, eggs, and dairy products do not take antibiotics or growth hormones. So that's a basic one. Um, but there are a few fine points. So something can be labeled 100% organic. If it says 100% organic on the package, it's made with 100% organic ingredients. Everything in it is organic. Now, to be an organic farm, you guys probably know or may not, may not, you need three years of no pesticides that aren't approved. There are things that are pesticides and herbicides that are acceptable in an organic farm. There are other materials that are used that don't have the toxicity. And it's that, I'm not going to get into all that semantics, but there are a few things that, that are pesticides that you can use. Um, but anyway, you have to have nothing used on your land that is one of the off-limits pesticides for three years. 
So during that interim time, if you're converting from conventional to organic, you can be in conversion and you can market your products as in conversion for those like two to three years as you're making that switch. But once you get to the three years of not using any of the things you're not allowed to use, and you've jumped through all the hoops, and you've paid all the money, and you've done all the paperwork, then you can get your organic certification. And that's USDA organic. There are a lot of other bodies that certify organic. Oregon Tilth is a very popular, famous one up in Oregon. Um, different states have developed their own um, rules and regulations. And some of that is for more control, because we don't trust the USDA all that much. And some of it is for um, the barrier, the, the cost barrier. So they've been able to do things a little bit less expensively um, for their local farmers in their state. So 100% organic. If it just says organic, then it has to be made with at least 95% organic ingredients. So you could put um, you know, soy lecithin in your chocolate bar, and if it's less than 5%, then you still have an organic product. Um, things like that if one thing is not organic. So it can still carry an organic label with 5% of you know, other stuff. Then there's made with organic ingredients, which is different. And you'll see packages like that. I didn't actually grab an example that would have been a good idea, but you guys know what I'm talking about. So made with organic ingredients means that a minimum of 70% organic ingredients with strict, restric strict restrictions on the remaining 30 including no GMOs. So if it says made with organic ingredients, it's going to be 70% organic and it shouldn't have anything GMO in it. Um, and then if it's a product that has less than 70% organic in it, then on the side of the package, they can say made with organic corn or made with organic, or sometimes you'll see labels where they put little stars after ingredients and then they tell you that those are the organic ones. Those are products that don't meet the 70% or 95% or 100%, but they have a lot of organic ingredients in them. And they can't emblazon that on the front. They can only say they're made with organic ingredients if they're at 70%, but they can put on the side label the individual ingredients if it's less than that. So that's important because when you know which ingredients you're worried about and which ingredients you're not worried about, then you can you can make some choices there um, as you read labels. But, um, but that's, that's just some helpful fine points that maybe we didn't know. Um, and then the other thing that comes up sometimes is that, okay, fine, they met USDA organic certification, but are they still organic? Are they still doing everything right? And that can be a gray area because that, that is about inspection. And, you know, is somebody out there on the ground making sure they're not using X, Y, or Z? Um, that comes into play more with a lot of the bigger farms that we don't trust as much. Um, we trust our local farms more, but something like Horizon Organic, where they're doing factory farming, but they're quote unquote organic, you know, okay, are they really being, you know, perfect? Who's holding them accountable? You know, that's where like Oregon Tilt might be a better standard because they're doing more work to sort of check up on things. So just to give you an idea that that's, that's out there as a concern of people, you know, in terms of, of what's going on. Okay, any questions about that? I have a question. Yeah. You said soy less with it. Right. Is it do you, does one just assume that that's non organic? Yes. All soy one assumes that that's GMO as a matter of fact. Always. If it's soy and you're in America, it is GMO until proven otherwise. Okay. And I'll get to the uh, the ratio, the percentage of crop that is GMO as well. And huh? when it says natural, are there any regulations? If it's natural, Thank you. or anybody can put Natural. Anyone can put natural on anything and it means absolutely nothing. <laughs> nothing. So and it's very frustrating because people are like, oh, it says it's natural, it's good for me. doesn't mean a thing. So with the soy left, but if it says um, organic and it's 95% organic, mm -hmm. the other 5% can't be GMO? It, yes. So yes. if it has soy lecithin, that's not organic. Then it should be okay. Yeah, then it should be GMO or non-GMO soy lecithin. Okay. Right, correct. Great point. All right, so another thing I wanted to do, um, because this is something that I didn't know about until somewhat recently, is you know all the little codes, the PLU codes that you have to punch in for produce? 
those are coded, there's clues there about how the protist was raised. And not everybody knows that, and I think it's kind of interesting. So it's optional for a producer to put that number code on their produce. They can do it or they cannot do it. It's, it's up to them. Um, if it has a four-digit or five-digit PLU code that starts with zero, conventional. Any produce code that starts with a zero is a conventional crop. If it has a five-digit code and it starts with an eight, it's genetically modified. Mm -hmm. If it has a five-digit code and it starts with a nine, it's organic. So that's something I didn't know. It's like, oh, okay. So there's another just little piece of, you know, there there are a few things out there that we've got a little bit of labeling. But it, but if you yeah, but if you produce a GM product and you don't want to do that, you can, you know, you don't have to label it at all. You don't have to put any numbers on it. Um, so that's an interesting little little piece there. Um, so when it comes to GMO, um, this is the top, um, the crops that we produce in the U.S. that are genetically modified. And um, what's interesting is um, those percentages too. So um, alfalfa, they just started. That started in 2011. We started producing um, genetically modified alfalfa. Um, canola, 90% of the U.S. crop of canola is genetically modified. So. Most of the time, the canola oil in your potato chip bag is going to be GMO, unless it says it's not. Um, corn, 88%. Now, last I checked, they were saying that popcorn was still not GMO, um, that particular crop, because that's a particular varietal of corn that they use. Um, but we're starting to hear about GM sweet corn and things like that. So unless you know for sure, you know, corn, 88%. Cotton, 90%. 90% of the cotton we grow is genetically modified. Um, papaya. This is one a lot of people don't know about. Papaya from Hawaii is genetically modified. Um, soy, 94% of the U.S. crop of the U.S. crop is genetically modified. So Sugar. If you're not eating a product, yes. Then, like your cotton and your clothing. Not too. The, only, the thing that's important is whether or not you philosophically want to support the industry of genetically modified crops and the pesticide piece and herbicide piece. So, you know, the, the crops, a lot of the crops that are GM are Roundup Ready and things like that. And so there's evidence that those growing those crops means we use more pesticide than if we grew conventionally even. So that's a, that's a point of your consumption and your dollars. Um, I think it wasn't that loud earlier. Will it no, no. settle down a little bit? Will it shut off for a little while? But <laughs> yeah, it'll shut off eventually, and I'm loud. Um, sugar beets. This one's important. Sugar beets that we're getting are, you know, cane sugar from, um, or not cane sugar, but a lot of the sugar products that they're made from sugar beets. 95% of the U.S. sugar beets are genetically modified. Um, and then this one is um, zucchini and yellow summer squash. So the crookneck yellow squash and zucchini, if you're buying it conventionally at the grocery store, could be genetically modified. So there you go. And sometimes, you know, these things are ingredients. Sometimes they're not, you know. Um, things that are in what they call the high-risk category. So this information comes from um, the non-GMO projects. I don't know if you guys have seen this. Um, the non-GMO shopping guide. This is an old version. I love their website and I have uh, their website for you to give you. Um, you can download the latest version. And the cool thing about this is that if you are doing, you know, most of us are getting some um, packaged products. Most of us aren't 100% whole food, you know, pull it out of the dirt and eat it. We're, we're, we're grabbing things here and there. This goes brand by brand and, and um, product by product and tells you what's going on with those foods and those ingredients. So that's, that's been really, really a cool um, thing. And this has a long list on the back page of invisible GM ingredients. And I'll talk about a couple of the, the um, most common ones. But there's lots of ingredients and additives that will be genetically modified most likely that we don't necessarily know are genetically modified. Um, so that's an interesting information. But they have a category called high risk, which is products that are at risk of being contaminated with GM genetics. 
um, which includes chard and table meats, rutabagas, Siberian kale, bok choy, Chinese cabbage, turnip, acorn squash, delicata squash, pecan squash, flax, rice, and wheat. So that was kind of like a, ooh, okay, what's going on there? And, you know, and again, you know, you guys kind of know this, but the basics are, you know, if you grow it yourself, that's, that's really the top of the line. You know, and the next is that your neighbor grew it. You know, the next is that it was grown down the, farm, down the road at a farm and you know what they're doing. And you go there and you visit them and you ask questions and you know what, what they're doing for integrated pest management and what they're spraying. You know, then you kind of get to, you know, biodynamic and permaculture and local. Because there's a lot of people who are doing a fabulous job. They're not using nasty stuff on their property, but they don't have the money or the time to go after organic certification. So there's a lot of great producers that are producing really good products that don't have an organic label because you got to jump through a lot of hoops to get an organic label. So, mm -hmm. so how is that, if we wanted to sell that type of produce here, and mm -hmm. store, what is the liability of the store to be selling? Is there any, is there it's just okay for a store like this to be selling those products? You can sell anything you want. You know, what I recommend is having some information, like we were and I talked about maybe having like a, a binder. Like sometimes you can put a little bit of information on a shelf, but you can't put a ton. You could write, you could put biodynamically grown or, you know, grown in a permaculture system, or you can have information on the specific farms. So it doesn't you have know. to be certified. No, to be good organic. You yeah. just need or to sell it. You need to know what's going on. Yeah. Right, the I don't, words. You're, you're saying the words. Right, each of those things are different. What about plants, like just such a short growing season here, and a lot of people have to buy already started plants. 
are those who count to be called organic or non-organic? Right. As far as I know, there aren't regulations for starts and things like that. Again, it goes back to knowing your farmer and knowing what they're doing, where it's coming from, you know, and just asking them questions. Um, and hopefully they're, they, they want to engage and they want to talk to you about it. And recognize that they do, sometimes they are using, you know, things, the fertilizers and pesticides and things like that that are in this sort of, okay, use them organic category and, you know, engage them and, and ask them about it and learn about it. You know, a lot of people are using integrated pest management or they're using, you know, soap or, you know, they're using different things on their crops. So, so talk to them about it. But yeah, as far as I know, there's no regulations for that. Um, okay, so do you want to hear more about GMOs? Is anything else about? Okay, so we'll kind of move on to talk about that. So the basics. Do you guys know about what they do to make a GMO crop? In terms of the okay, so it's kind of it's very interesting, and it's way less scientific than they want you to think it is. Um, basically, you take a cell and you grab a cocktail of other DNA and things that you are thinking would be interesting to put in that cell. So, um, BT corn and um, cotton is a good example where there are, um, there's uh, a BT toxin that is toxic to bugs. And they took the genetics of the making of that. There's a bacteria that will make that toxin. So they took the genes for making the toxin and they punch a hole in a cell into the, and get to the DNA. They actually get into the DNA. And they just inject this bacteria. Sometimes, it's, sometimes there's virus pieces. Sometimes there's um, genetics from animals. All kinds of different, you know, super cocktail. And they, they shove it in there and they, and they let it, you know, work it, do whatever it's going to do with those chromosomes in that DNA. There's not, we're going to replace this gene with this gene, or we're going to pull this out, and we're going to add this in. They can't be that specific. They just, you know, fractionate the DNA, shove all that stuff in there, and then see what happens when they grow it out. So all kinds of things happen. Um, up to 400 genes have been recorded as being altered in one genetically modified, you know, thing. So they're going after one thing, and they end up with a whole bunch of other gene mutations. So all kinds of things can happen. We really have no idea what all of those are until we start growing them out, you know, and, and producing them. Um, but what we created with them, with PT, is we created a corn plant that produces its own pesticide, produces the BT toxin. And one of the concerns that uh, people in, in health have is that your gut bacteria are coming directly into contact with these plants and these genes, and bacteria love to swap genes. They don't have to sexually reproduce to swap genes. They can just get up next to each other and pass genes back and forth. That's how antibiotic resistance spreads so fast, is a couple of bacteria survive an antibiotic assault, and then they share those genes with other species and other bacteria of their own species. So there's concern that some of these things we're putting in genes can get into our gut bacteria, and then maybe our gut bacteria can produce BT toxin in our bodies. You know, there's a lot of things we don't know. Um, we are the guinea pigs, we are the experiment. The whole rest of the world is saying, let's see what happens to the Americans. Let's watch their children grow up, and then we'll decide whether or not we want these things in our food. Um, it's, it's scary because we don't know. What we do know in um, animal research um, is we, we get fertility problems all the time with GM crops when they're fed to animals. Uh, fertility goes down, um, abortions go up, birth defects go up, um, animals come, become frankly stale. When they switch them back to or to non-GM foods, they can recover, um, but we definitely documented fertility issues over and over and over again with GM crops. And, you know, is, is what it's doing to a mouse or a pig going to be that much different than what it's doing to us? You know, probably not. That's why we use animals to experiment on because they're real close to us. So, so there's a lot of concern there. Um, they've documented immune dysregulation, upregulation of cytokines that contribute to asthma, allergy, and inflammation, um, altered structure and function of the liver, altered um, fat and carbohydrate metabolism, cellular changes that could lead to um, reactive 
back to back those species, which is a free radical. Um, changes in the kidney, the pancreas, the spleen, um, and genes just being expressed differently. The two most common things we see in animals are intestinal damage and fertility problems. Those are the two biggies that we see over and over and over and over and over again. And from what I know as a naturopathic doctor, all you have to do is change a protein a little bit and it can become allergenic and your body can fight it in an autoimmune way. Um, that's the problem we have with pasteurized milk. A lot of people don't tolerate pasteurized milk. Heat denatures protein. It twists and changes the protein structure a little bit and then your body doesn't recognize it and thinks it's a foreign invader and mounts an immune response. And all it takes is some heat to twist that protein. And a lot of people who don't tolerate pasteurized milk, you put them on raw milk and they're fine. They no longer have that reaction. So DNA codes for protein. We, when we're trying to do genetic modification, we're trying to change protein. So we're deliberately trying to modify what proteins look like. So it just, it just doesn't make sense how you couldn't cause autoimmune problems when you're messing with the shape and structure of these proteins and their body's not recognized. And that will cause GI inflammation, and, and then you're not digesting your food properly, and you know a whole bunch of things are happening. Um, so it really comes down to World Health Organization, the American Academy of Environmental Medicine. A lot of groups are saying the precautionary principle is what we need here. You know, prove they're safe, and instead of throwing them at us, at us and then telling us to prove that they're not safe, you know, we don't we don't know. We were part of the experiment. Um, and uh, I personally don't like being part of the experiment because we don't really know what's going to happen. Um, and there's been reports of people coming into eating genetically modified foods and having reactions. We don't have a lot of data yet. You know, we barely have much in terms of animal studies. So we're starting to try and get, you know, um, studies for what's going on in people, but it's still in a thing. So, you know, we don't know. So let's, let's not, you know, not subject our, our bodies to that if we don't know. And there's the environmental piece of what GMOs are doing. They're, they're destroying organic farming in a lot of places because plants cross-pollinate and those genes are moving into other plants, you know. And we already have a history of Monsanto, you know, they put in a, a GM crop and then the farmer next door stuff gets contaminated with this GM pollen. They test his seeds and they say, you have GM genetics in your seeds and they sue them for a breach of patent because they're growing GM seed and they didn't pay Monsanto for it. They've been doing that for a long time. A long time. Yeah, they are. And then they get their, they they pay off the farmer, you know, they sue, sue them. They've got tons of lawyers and tons of money. So they bury them in legalness and then they offer them a settlement and the settlement always says you can't breathe the word about this to anybody you know so they have to say you know mom and then we can't build you know much of a case so that that's been happening for a very long time um a lot of a lot of yeah and the and the pesticide piece you know they're saying that if we produce these gm crops we're going to have higher crop yields we can, we're going to be able to feed the world we've been using that argument forever it never holds up and, um, and we're going to use less pesticides, but we haven't seen that as a reality. We've seen more pesticides. We've seen super weeds that are resistant to Roundup because they're benefiting from these genes and they're cross pollinating. All kinds of weird things are happening, um, and they're having to get bigger and badder and nastier pesticides to use on these crops. So it hasn't reduced pesticide use. It hasn't increased yields. It hasn't done any of the things they promised that it's going to do. Uh, but it has hurt lots and lots and lots of local farmers and it's threatening our food security because the idea is we own the seed you can't grow anything unless you pay us for it and reduces diversity and you know re gets rid of all the varietals that you know grow better 200 feet above this varietal and you know all of that diversity they're trying to get rid of um so it's a huge food security issue as well um there's 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 a lot there's <laughs> health and economics and environment and food security and lots of things. All right, so do you guys have any questions about all of that? That was kind of a lot. So if it says it's organic, then it's non-GMO? Or can it be organic and still have If it, so I, those last two categories,
categories, um, if it says 100% organic or organic, then, then you should be good to go as far as GMOs. If it says made with organic ingredients, it shouldn't have any GMOs in it. But if it just has like specifically labeled ingredients that are organic, like on the side label, then there could be GMO in it. So as a general rule, I do tell people if it's labeled organic, then it shouldn't have GMOs in it. Because that's part of the regulation for most of those of those labels. I mean, if it has one or two organic ingredients in it, there might be other things in there that are GMO. For example, um, like the potato chips or the chips that'll say made with organic corn. You know, it's like, okay, the corn's organic, but the canola, safflower, and soy oil, are those organic or not? You know, according to this, if it says made with organic ingredients on the label, those should be non-GMO. But we need a labeling law. We need the rules around this so that we have something. There is, the non-GMO project has their own label, and I'm sure that there's some products in here that have that label. Um, they are doing their own certifying to say that things are not GMO voluntarily. So that is helping a lot. And as we get states, as we get Vermont on board, you know, if we can get, Cal if we get California, then because they're such huge producers, it will shift the whole country. You know, because a, a producer, a manufacturer, isn't gonna label separately for Vermont than they are for the whole rest of the Northeast. Mm -hmm. So if they start labeling GMOs in Vermont, then their labeling is going to be going out to all the other states where they market to. So that's a piece of getting that ball rolling of if we can get one state, two states, three states doing this, we will start to affect that shift. Because politically, you know, these companies have way too much money to spend to keep it from happening. So what's what behind the whole label cost to buy our why are people opposed yeah. to GMO labeling? Money. Right. Right. Um, what has happened in the states that have um, brought something, and we will see this if we if we have enough signatures on that petition, or the petition we just submitted at uh, the beginning of the month, like this last week, to get GMO labeling in Colorado. If that goes through, and we actually get a ballot measure, you'll get to see it firsthand because millions millions of dollars will be spent on advertising to tell us that it's a terrible idea to label GMOs. And they will use everything they can come up with. You know, that it's bad for farmers, that's a popular one. That it makes no difference. You know, that these foods are the same, or that this is going to burden regulation, that this is going to make food costs more, that this is going to do X, Y, and Z. And really, it's just millions of dollars coming from these companies who will lose their shirt if we start labeling GMOs. Because they know that if we label GMOs, people are going to start choosing things that aren't GMO. People okay. have people know enough. I think someone said you may as well just put a poison label on. Yes, someone they did say that. Mm -hmm. long <laughs> a long time ago, and that's why they've been fighting it tooth and nail. Because that's their whole industry up in smoke, and they have a ton of money to throw at. So, so that's what they've done in every single state. They've poured, poured tons of money into lobbying, into advertisements, into TV, into billboards, into all sorts of things, and certainly putting pressure on, you know, political figures that in that local economy to get people to vote it down. And it's been working, which is a very sad, sad situation. So, you know, we need to be doing everything we can to help to continue to educate people about it, because just getting it on the ballot isn't enough. It's been on a lot of ballots and it hasn't made it. You know, and it might not make this ballot, depending on what happened with our signatures and everything like that, in which case, you know, next year we'll be bringing around a petition again and we'll be trying to get more people to sign it because, it, you know, it's a big, it's a big deal. How many signatures did you need at the You need 86,000, some kind of hundred. And so what happens with, um, with petitions like that is they have to validate all of the signatures so they have to be registered voters. You can't have said you live in, you know, Pitkin County when you really live in Garfield County. Your signature needs to look like it does on your driver's license or your voter registration. Everything has to be perfect. So what they do, our goal is use, is to collect twice as many signatures as we actually need. So we need 86,000 validated signatures. 
and I don't know exactly how many we did get um, in terms of non-validating, because that's all we would know. We would know we filled this many petitions up. But some of them, you know, there's a line crossed through, or they misput something, or it's not legible, or whatever. There can be a lot of reasons that they get thrown out. So that's why any petition like that, we're going to be looking for double the number of signatures that we need. But we needed 86,000 valid Colorado voters to sign the petition to get it on ballot. And then we'll see what happens. Now we just we just had a ballot measure. We had two ballot measures about oil and gas. And Hickenlooper just created this committee and made a deal that we would withdraw those two petitions and the industry would withdraw their two petitions and we would have this committee that would make these decisions. So he, with one foul swoop, just said, forget it. You did all that work to get all these petitions to get us on the ballot. I'm just going to go over here around you, and we're going to take that right off the ballot. So funny things can happen in politics all the time. What are you going to say? Yeah, I have a question. The labeling system, mm -hmm. I always uh, uh, see the natural flavors. This the ingredients, and then at some point we'll measure natural flavors. Right. So, also means nothing. Probably yeah. came out of a lab in New Jersey. New Jersey is the, the king of artificial flavors and colors and fragrances and all those kinds of things. Usually they're proprietary. Um, anything that's labeled um, fragrance on a product, if it's not an essential oil, is a carcinogen until proven otherwise. Most of them are phthalates. They're like all kinds of nasty chemicals. Um, but they have these these rules for intellectual property and formula so that they can call it perfume and they don't have to disclose what's in it. Um, you know, it can have benzene in it, it can have whatever they want in it. And um, natural flavors can be anything. Um, again, natural doesn't mean anything. Um, the list of additives, so common food ingredients that come from GMO crops, amino acids, aspartame, which you shouldn't be doing anyway. Ascorbic acid, which is vitamin C. If ascorbic acid, um, a, not all of it is going to be GMO because most ascorbic acid isn't produced in the U.S. and other countries aren't using GM corn, so it's it's you know um, sodium ascorbate, vitamin C, citric acid, sodium citrate, ethanol, flavoring, natural and artificial, right there. High fructose corn syrup, corn. Forget it. Um, hydrolyzed vegetable protein. Big deal for all of those vegetarians. Um, soy, jam soy. Um, lactic acid, maltodextrin, molasses, because of the sugar beet. Uh, monosodium glutamate, sucrose, textured vegetable protein, um, xanthan gum, and uh, some vitamins and yeast products. So again, it's know your farmer, know your company, you know, um, know what they're sourcing, and you know, make sure that you've got people that you can trust. And we've got salmon now. We have GM salmon, which I just, it's hard to think something worse than that. I'm sure there will be worse things, but, um, you know, genetically modified salmon that can escape and interbreed with our native salmon we're having so much trouble already is just really, really scary. Any other questions? I'm not feel exhausting. <laughs> everything organic. It's like, okay, fine. Buy these things organic. You know, buy your strawberries organic, please, for the love of God. Buy your strawberries organic. But buy your onions conventional. You know, so helping people get a little bit of information to guide, you know, their their um, their choosing of, of what they buy. So there's that. And then this is a list of websites 
Uh, one of them is the GMO project and some of them that Carlos put together that are just more information about labeling and GM and all that kind of stuff. Why strawberries organic? Because they use so much pesticide on them. So much. A lot of kids have strawberry allergies and I don't think it's a strawberry allergy, I think it's a pesticide reaction. Yep. Right, like garlic. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, so they do a job. And they're underground, which makes them harder to get to. And yeah. Great. Well, thank you so much for your attention. Thank you for the space. Thank you, Carlo. Thank you. I really appreciate it. All right, thank, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. So, uh, yeah, thank you guys for coming and thanks, Jody, once again. Mm -hmm. And uh, the idea is uh, to uh, keep this growing. Uh, we welcome any other ideas about future lectures yeah. and also.